One of our very distinguished former ambassadors to America, Kim Beasley, made the comment that here in Australia, we tend not to be able to understand America very well because we get the East Coast and the West Coast. We get Hollywood and we get New York. We don't get real America and real America is very different. How do you think real Americans feel, if I can put it that way? Well, they're all, I don't want to imply that they're real and unreal Americans. That's not fair. No, me, I, I get it. But, but Americans in the middle, the American in flyover America. How are they feeling about all of this? And where do you think they might seek to go in the future in such a polarised environment? You know, I think uh, if you want to use that term, flyover country, uh, we'll do it. there's, a, there's a, a, a huge and obvious divide between kind of blue state America and red state America. And it's, it's essentially a difference between the coasts and the middle of the country and urban America and the areas outside the cities, right? So if you look at how the, how the, the country votes, outside the cities, it's mostly all red. Inside the cities, it's mostly all blue. And the cultural divide is just enormous. I mean, um, people just, again, they just don't, they don't occupy the same factual universes. I, I think it's, it's really kind of depressing for me because, um, you know, I've had a lot of, I've covered uh, a lot of different things um, in the United States in the last 20 years or so. And my experience has always been that Americans um, tend to be pretty decent to one another when they're removed from the political discussion. You know, I've seen people, uh, you know, I, I covered the Iraq war and I saw people from very different backgrounds uh, getting along, you know, perfectly and cooperating, even though that was a terrible situation or, or Hurricane Katrina. But you get them in a place where they have to start talking about politics. And it's it's a it's a death battle. Now, people just do not have any common ground anymore. There used to be some. Um, I think we used to get a, there used to be some areas where sort of upper class cosmopolitan in America and and kind of rural middle class America, um, there there was some overlap. But now it's 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 basically two different countries. And I think there's a tremendous amount of resentment out there, um, especially towards kind of upper class cosmopolitan, um, you know, college educated or more America, that that divide is, is just getting bigger and bigger every day. Can I ask you, um, one of my guests, Warren Farrell, uh, who, who's, you know, staunchly Democrat, uh, when uh, President Biden was uh, uh, inaugurated, uh, made the comment uh, to me that the first thing that he felt that Biden should do was to actually do the very thing he didn't do in the end, not roll back very many of Trump's executive orders and so forth, put that to one side for a while and go out and visit the red states, where, as he put it, uh, father, uh, faith, family and fathers still mattered. That was the way he put it. Uh, and, and, and sit down as much as possible, do what we would call in Australia a listening tour and as president, say, I want to reunify the country. What was it that drove you to support President Trump? Why were you so frustrated? Would that have helped? Or do you think perhaps I'm missing something and it's happened? But my impression is it hasn't happened. The new administration seems more determined than ever to um, uh, exacerbate and carry forward the warfare and the expectation that they'll win because they're right. That's the tone of it that you do sort of get a bit yeah, from and, this uh, side of the world. I think, I think you're right. Um, I think that was a major factor in, for instance, why Hillary Clinton didn't win in 2016. In fact, Barack Obama even said that after, um, after Hillary lost to Trump. He said, you know, the reason that I won um, was that I went to every little small town in Iowa uh, when I campaigned and I didn't just go to the places that I knew were going to support me. I went to the other places too, and I talked to them. And I think, you know, Obama, there are, there are many things that I, that I criticized about him uh, for when he was president, but he did do that. He, he made a, a conscious effort to at least kind of listen to what was going on in those other parts of the country. And he had tremendous amount of success in these territories that we called like the Reagan Democrat districts, you know, people, the districts that had been traditionally democratic, but they leaned towards Reagan in the 80s or Bush in the early 2000s. He did well there, I think, because he talked to them. That has not been the strategy of Democrats uh, since 2016. There's been 
really no effort at all to kind of reach out and even understand what's going on in red state America. Uh, it's It's been sort of constant demonization of Trump, which on, the, on one level I kind of get because it animates their following, but you're basically foregoing uh, massive amounts of votes. And I also just morally don't think it's the right thing to do if you're if you're leading a country. Like, you have to show that you're interested in being their president, too. Um, and that's kind of what hasn't happened. Now, to be fair, Trump didn't do that whole lot of that either in the other direction. But um, but he was he did court voters on the other side. He went after Bernie Sanders voters. Uh, he was very open to the idea that anybody was welcome to vote for him, which you don't even hear Democrats say. Um, so I think you're right. I think that's a big problem that there's this, this tone of we're talking to our people and that's it. Uh, the, the Biden's aides have been openly telling journalists that we've given up trying to get votes across the aisle, that we're going to govern as we see fit from now on, uh, just with the votes that we have, and that's how we're going to do things. I, I, I don't know that that's a good strategy. The, um, the one thing that it does seem both sides uh, of politics in America and uh, presumably a lot of people in the community uh, are unified on is the whole question of the challenge of China. Uh, that uh, does seem to be a unifying factor. Now, there's, a, there's an, a nationalism that is deplorable, in fact, you know, most authoritarian regimes deploy it effectively and horribly. Uh, but there's a patriotism that's admirable, concern for your fellow citizens, your family, if you like, and their values and the things that bind them together. Is it possible that the very real challenges that China now poses, uh, and indeed, um, you know, the, the possibility for miscalculation and very serious consequences could in fact provide a, a, a uniforming sort of um, uh, spirit for America as they uh, recognize that there are forces uh, at, uh, at large now that don't care very much about America's internal squabbles or Australia's internal squabbles. Uh, they just essentially want to end our, our freedom and our way of life. Do you see that as a potential unifier uh, and, and a way forward in a perverse way to ending the terrible differences that are tearing Western cultures apart? So um, Americans have, had a, have always had kind of a schizophrenic attitude towards China. Uh, you know, I think if you, you go back and you read books like Manufacturing Consent, you, you see that you know, for a long time until the collapse of the Soviet Union, I think the, the sort of organizing religion in American society was anti-communism, but it was very, it was very oriented towards Russia and the Soviet Union. The the villain in American movies and American pop culture is historically is a you know a Slavic or a Russian gangster or uh, you know it, the, the, towards the Chinese. I think Americans have very. Um, confused feelings. And I think this, this goes back to the 90s when um, when we first started to see like the sort of mass export of the American manufacturing economy. And there was a political divide uh, in America about whether or not we should be aggressive towards China or whether we should open our markets towards China. Um, Bill Clinton opted to give uh, China most favored nation trading status and that's kind of where politically the status quo in this country has rested ever since. And I, I think it's been confusing, especially kind of for uh, traditionally liberal Americans who usually prioritize human rights and um, and would normally be sort of up in arms about a lot of the things that go on in China. But uh, the, their political leaders don't act that way. It was similar. I think that was very. Uh, symbolic when um, there was that whole argument with the NBA when one of the le the uh, the owners of the Houston Rockets spoke out against uh, abuses in China and he was immediately sort of castigated by LeBron James and other other famous yep. athletes because the money was coming from China you know so that yeah. that's kind of the problem with America we're very dependent on Chinese money um, it's everywhere in our culture especially in in uh, communications and um, in Hollywood. Uh, and in the finance sector, there's tons and tons of Chinese money. Uh, we borrow tons of money from the Chinese. Um, and even during the COVID thing, uh, 
there hasn't been this kind of rallying of uh, national animosity towards China on the level that you might expect. It's it's been more direct towards Russia even now. Um, so it's possible. There's there's a, there's a history of of us kind of bonding together over things like 9/11 um, when we feel like we're under assault, but that hasn't fully galvanized yet. I don't think in this country. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.